you will have to accept that it's being recorded. Say got it or whatever. Okay, today, uh, Karen Yi is going to talk about Japanese woodblock prints, Yukio E. Um, Karen has been a longtime volunteer at the American Cancer Society Discovery Shop on Marconi near Fulton. Several months ago, someone gifted, donated 20 plus Japanese woodblock prints. Uh, the prints were very valuable. Uh, and Karen realized that. And so she was the one who was tasked with trying to determine their value and how much they would uh, price them for in the, uh, in the shop. Uh, she'll talk a little bit about that. As she began her research, uh, she realized that this was an amazing craft. I think she already knew that and that there's a lot of history behind it. And so she wanted to research it further. And as she researched and took photos of those blocks, she came up with the class. And here we are today, we get to be the uh, benefits of that class. So uh, next, I would like to say, please keep your microphone muted. Uh, turn your video off, if you know how to do that. And if you have questions, go ahead and put them in the chat and we'll collect them there. And then at the end, uh, we'll allow time for you and to ask questions. You will be able to turn your microphone on and ask questions then. So without further ado, I'm going to stop screen share and ask Karen to go ahead and uh, hit the screen share at the bottom. and share. Oh, beautiful. Perfect. Okay. Yes. Well, hi, everybody. Um, this is a wonderful subject that I had did not know anything about. I'm not Japanese, I'm Chinese. But when these prints came in, this uh, donor donated not only woodblock prints framed, or, and also lots of, they, he must, he and she must have been so interested in Japanese things. They purchased these in 1981 and um, from Yokohama and on the back of these prints, they were all framed in Japan. Uh, the, um, they had uh, letters of authenticity. So um, we know that they're very old. But Japanese woodblock prints were started in like 1600s. So this was before photography and this was before um, people, I mean, they were trying to just imprint an image on paper by um, carving it out and, and printing it and rubbing ink on it. And, but I was amazed how intricate they were able to make these prints and then as color developed from Europe and different places where they could find different colors. In those days, they weren't just squeezing out a bottle of ink or a, <clears throat> a tube of ink, but they had to uh, really grind the stones and everything down. So uh, the colors are not real, real vivid. And as uh, the color intensity was able to be produced better, then you'll see the newer prints have got much brighter colors. <clears throat> but this is just a wonderful thing. Um, I was just fascinated by, I, I tried to do some research. I called the Crocker Art Museum, uh, trying to see if, uh, oops, I'm not being able to um, advance my, <laughs> my next slide. Try the down arrow on your keyboard. I am and it's not working. Mm. Okay, hold on. Uh, move your mouse over to the edge of the slide and click on it. Oh, okay. So I can use the mouse. Maybe that's what the problem is. Okay. Well, this is uh, an example of a much newer print. Um, it's not a 1600 uh, date, but you can see how vivid the colors are. But I did contact the Crocker Art Gallery because I was hoping to sell all these prints to them, they said they already have a collection and um, I really wanna find out when they're going to 
show it as an exhibit. So um, look forward to that someday. I also contacted a, um, a dealer in New York, the Rowan Gallery, and he was interested. I showed him pictures of them all, but uh, he said without being able to determine the exact age of the prints and seeing them up close and personal, uh, he did not want to buy them because I was hoping I could sell the whole lot to them and then just donate the money to the American Cancer Society. But anyway, we'll get on to, um, okay. So woodblock prints, <clears throat> and it does explain that it was donated to the American Cancer Society in April of 21. And I um, was able to uh, do the sale in June, the first part of June. So we, um, <clears throat> and this is an example of a woodblock print. And you can see that if, if you can imagine trying to carve out all the, um, the figures and the wording on this by hand, I, I just don't know, without you know modern tools like little drills and things like that, it's just, I don't know how people can do this, but they were able to do this. Um, I think books were first uh, introduced, I mean, letters were first introduced and then pictures and uh, things like that. So this is an example of a book that did come in. That was two pages from this book that did come in and, and was sold at the shop. But you can see that it was bound by um, stitching it together and um, it had lots of pictures. And actually this was an unusual book because it had colored, also colored pages in it. So it's not that old. Here's another example of the pages in the book. It, it must be some kind of a novel um, because there's a lot of different characters in it, but I don't, if you can read kanji, and this is an old fashioned writing, so not very many people can read it because it's more simplified. Japanese writing is more simplified now, but in the old days, they put it together. And <clears throat> people who actually carved, the students would, be um, allowed to carve the words first or letters. And then later on, they would be able to do the pictures. I mean, it took like 10 years to do the training for carving these things. And so um, it's quite an involved process, you can see. <clears throat> Here's another page of it. So um, Japanese people were very fascinated with fashion and they looked at you know, pictures, because you couldn't do a photograph of prints and the style of clothing, especially women were very interested in that. So later on, you'll see examples of that. Now, this is the most important job. <clears throat> this is a picture of a woodblock carver. And you can see how precise, and he has a lot of times have to use a magnifying glass to carve out these shapes on the piece of wood. They use boxwood, so that um, it would not absorb the ink. Um, and usually prints could only be printed about 200 times and then it was mushy or, you know, the picture was distorted. So, you know, they had to be so careful. They had to do it during a printing during a certain uh, time of the year because of the humidity in Japan. So <clears throat> the, um, this was, but this was the most important person in here besides the artist. This is an example of an actual wood block. And I think there was somebody who said they had a wood block. Um, so the, <clears throat> you can see they had to carve it the opposite way when you're printing. <laughs> I can't exa explain it, but um, then, you know, then the paper goes on it and then it, it's a opposite relief on it, but it's just, <clears throat> And they were limited by the size of the wood block and they were limited by the size of the paper. So this is how, this is the process that these prints were made. The artist would draw the pattern and then he would send it to the publisher. Now the publisher could decide whether he really wanted to publish this or whether he didn't like the artwork. And uh, the, it's like a book, going to a book publisher, you wanna try to, sell your thing to somebody and you can go to a lot of different publishers to get your book printed. Um, anyway, he's very important. He was the key person to start this process going. If he approved it and he got 
uh, approval from a censor because the government looked at these two, uh, he would take it to an engraver and the wood cover would spend, you know, a couple months trying to uh, make this print and uh, the lines and the details were just very precise. Then it would go to the printer. <clears throat> and now the printer has to mix the inks and he would, there's a special spot on the wood block. It's called a Karen or something where you have to lay the paper exactly in the right alignment, Kento mark. Um, and then you could lay it on there and then you put your ink on, then you put the paper on and then you'd rub the top of it and then the imprint would come on your paper. And then it would go to the publisher's shop. And these were like posters or newspaper. People would just go to a shop and say, yes, I'd like to buy that print. But when it's a limited number, because as you got towards the 200 mark, you know, the print would not be as precise or clear. And so a lot depended on the publisher and then the publisher could pay the artist and the woodcarver and the printer. So it took many people to do this and months and it had to be timed at the right time. Um, also, it depended on the paper that they used because there's different uh, types of or qualities of papers. And this is one thing that the um, Rowan Art Gallery in uh, New York told me that, you know, he could gauge the age and the, by the, the paper, by the, all the different marks that were on the print. But because these uh, prints were um, framed in Japan, he couldn't, I did not want to take it apart to show him the back of it or anything like that, or I couldn't, uh, my pictures were not as precise to, I'd have to go through every little piece to find uh, the different marks on it. So this is, shows a picture of, uh, this is a later version of a woodblock print. You can see that the ladies are there buying woodblock prints. Uh, in Japan, they don't use furniture, they use kind of little tables to sit on. And it just shows the ladies in there looking at woodblock prints. Now, people didn't know about woodblock prints in Europe until many of these pieces of paper were like uh, wrapping paper for China that was sent to Europe. But people started looking at these, um, the wrapping on it and they say, oh, these are pretty nice. I mean, it's just like newspaper to the people in Japan after you know, you've looked at your poster or something and you just kind of wad it up or discard it and then they used it to, to pad China that was shipped to Europe. And so people started noticing it, but uh, it wasn't real popular. Well, it was also rare. You didn't, a lot of times it was crumpled up too much or destroyed that you wouldn't want to use it as a, just a piece of art. This is a, an example of how detailed the work could be. And the reason why it took so long for an apprentice to uh, get to the point where he could carve for pictures is because of the dynamics uh, of the action and also the facial expressions. And it was just really uh, the printer and the, uh, the publisher and the artist were really keeping an eye on that kind of thing. So, and here's a, I was just telling you about the China being wrapped as a padding. For Europe. So as uh, color developed from uh, different, I mean, they were getting uh, color pigments from different parts of the world. So you don't see a lot of blues or greens, it's more oranges and reds and purples. And, and they were using natural dyes too to get the ink on there. And the first prints could be more vivid than, of course, the last prints. <laughs> um, and every color that you see on a woodblock print is applied separately. So the first print that goes on is black and white, and then you add the color and then, so the printer has to make his color and then put it on that part of the block print and then put it on your print. So it's, yeah, it takes a lot of patience. Now it's really difficult to identify um, times. This is an example of years that uh, a block print was printed. So if the block print has this identification mark, you can tell by the years and the, then you'd have to go back and look at the year that the, uh, the artist was alive. And hopefully that was coinciding by 
the year that was printed on the block print. So if <clears throat> it didn't coincide, it may be the print may have been redone at a later time. So all of those in combination, it's just hard to identify exactly when these things were made, unless you read kanji. But you can see it's by uh, the year of the, um, <clears throat> and then uh, let's see, I think, I wonder if some of these are um, sensor marks. And it just shows on a general block print, you know, where these things were. It depends on where the carver wanted to put uh, the different, um, pieces on here. <clears throat> so it's uh, identification marks on here. And sometimes this would be the title of the print. And sometimes this would be the, yeah, the artist's signature. Sometimes they did it in kanji just with a kind of a border or sometimes they didn't. So uh, here's the date seal. So if you're lucky to have a woodblock print that has all that information on it, then you can tell, you know, <clears throat> when it was made. So um, this tells you identification. Now, the government had strict control over the kind of subject matter that a publisher could publish his works. So um, because they, <laughs> for some reason, they didn't want it to be too fancy because it would cause jealousy over the people that were looking at these things. So the government said, OK, this year you can do women, uh, but we don't want to do courtesans you can do regular women, or this year you can do um, landscapes, or you can do butterflies or birds or something. So the government was really having strict control over it. They also probably took a little tax off of each woodblock print too. Uh, this is an example of artist signatures. So, um, <clears throat> and some of them are really tiny. Sometimes they would, uh, the wood carver would have to carve the signature in because the artist normally wouldn't um, just sign each piece because that's 200 of them. So um, <clears throat> it just shows a bunch of uh, the way they put together an identification of uh, the prints. This one, you are not sure, this area right here could be a title or it could be a poem or it could be, well, you just need somebody who could read this kind of stuff. And we didn't, but um, you can see the action in here. It's just so interesting. Sometimes it has had a lot of action. Sometimes there was just none. It could be a poem. Um, here's another one. In the very beginning, only rich people could uh, get an artist to put together a picture or have his um, poem. It was uh, many richer people belonged to poetry um, <clears throat> clubs, and they would write a poem, then they'd want a woodblock print with a, a picture of their, or a copy of their poem on it, and they would send it to their best friends as a gift. So sometimes the um, person who was giving the gift would, you know, kind of sign it too, or put his stamp on it. So it's a little bit confusing, but um, <clears throat> they certainly were beautiful gifts, and they were limited. So it could be, you know, maybe you have a run of five or ten, and so those are very rare. This is a triptych by Kunisada, who was one of the most prolific woodblock printers. And it's because of the size of the limit of the size of the paper, you can see that it had to be done in three sections. And they kind of tried to match it up here and there. You can see his signature here. And then this one is different. So sometimes he was such a well-known, he was one of the most well-known artists. He had a studio and just like uh, some of uh, like Michelangelo or some of these other famous artists of the time, they had uh, students or other artists finish a print for them. So that's possibly why this is a different, um, <clears throat> a different seal on it. But he was a, the most prolific, uh, artist. He wasn't, didn't come from an art background. He, um, and he apprenticed very young because they noticed his talent by this artist named Toyokuni. And <clears throat> many times <laughs> the artist would change their name to their, in honor of their teacher's name in, at this time. So, I mean, this is before the gold rush. So sometimes they would put their entire name on it. Sometimes they would only put 
their honored uh, teacher's name on it. But he was very famous for kabuki uh, actor prints, which were like posters that they would put in the theater, in front of the theaters of the actors and of women. He was very successful. He employed lots of other artists and he was also a poet, a poet and writer. So he knew many of the other <clears throat> really famous uh, woodblock printers and writers of the time. So he was just well connected. This, is, uh, this was on the back of some of the prints that came into our shop. So you can see that it was um, bought from a uh, Yokohama um, and it was supposed to, it, they tried to uh, put the right date on it and you know, it's not, uh, but it was, this was the years that this artist was alive. So um, it was kind of in the middle of when he might've have, have, um, printed this off. <clears throat> This is another uh, a triptych by another artist. And unfortunately, they didn't put it together very well because you can see the seams, the glue seams on it. But you can see how they needed to line it up, this piece of paper and this one, with, they tried to keep it, you know, um, <clears throat> cohesive throughout the, the picture. These are pictures of women, um, I'm not exactly sure they're, they're sharing a meal because they have these little boxes of food. And this might have been like a brazier or something, maybe cooking something on there. They loved floral prints and they loved lots of material. And they also loved looking at hairstyles. So sometimes you can tell uh, the age of a print by what type of hairstyles they had. This is, um, they were very interested in seasons. So rain and snow were often put into prints. And um, this is a famous one. I did not get the name of this artist, um, but it's, it's really quite pretty. This is Half Moon Bridge by Tiyoshi Yoshida. And this is a print that did come in and it's, it's really gorgeous. Uh, Toshi Yoshida was an artist, a uh, more contemporary artist. He toured the United States and really got people interested in woodblock prints. But you can see that it's um, very detailed. It had backgrounds on it. He used more, a little more vivid colors. And the Western people didn't always, they liked scenery. They didn't always like to have just an individual um, person or a uh, picture on. So he um, was a very interesting. He, Many, it was 1911 when he was born in Tokyo and uh, he toured all over the world, a lot of, you know, Asia to Africa and, and he did a lot of pictures everywhere. So uh, if you go to um, a museum in the US and you'll probably see one of his woodblock prints if they are showing it because he is a, an interesting person. So, um, and this is just explaining that he, <clears throat> uh, so that was a picture that came into the shop that we um, were able to sell for a pretty high price. Now, this is another picture that came into the shop. I think this was by Kunisada. In the early days, many times the artist would not put their name on it. And you can see that there's not too much an identification on here. This might be the sensor seal on it. But, um, and, but this is also a later uh, print because it has background. You'll see some of the early ones that came in um, only has a person in it and not this extra background in it. Oh, 1850. Maybe there was a, <laughs> a card on the back to try to tell what it was. <clears throat> now he, and you can see he was um, instrumental in developing lots of extra, um, try to intensifying the colors at his studio. So you can see that how dark he was able to make it. <clears throat> so, um, and this, I'm not sure why they put this on here, but it's kind of an interesting um, addition to the, the regular print. This is um, a bridge scene. This is a later one because you can see there's background, there's a lot more color and there's a lot more detail to it. Now this is an earlier print, 1840s, and you can see it's just a person and they used black and white. <clears throat> a little bit of color in here, the pink 
but it might have faded a little bit, but this was a, a picture that came in to the shop. Now we were able to um, sell all of the prints and uh, the discovery shop was able to, uh, we were able to get about around $10,000 for everything that came in and sold. But the person who donated actually um, donated a lot of stuff. They went to Japan in the eight, no, 1950s and brought, they went to kabuki shows, they went to sumo wrestling, and they gave us all this paper, I mean, programs and things like that. Some people were really interested in that. Also a lot of books that were sold uh, from the sale. <clears throat> this one, this one, I don't know, some, one of my friends said that they were able to interpret this, this sign here, and it's supposed to say not much makeup. So I don't know. It's kind of funny why that, that would be the title of it. This is an earlier print. You can tell from the paper, <clears throat> sometimes it's kind of a beige or yellowish, and sometimes it's whiter. So it depends on the printer, who he wants, what kind of paper he wants to use, and how old it. The older ones were more of this color, and the newer prints were lighter color. <clears throat> this is just the background, a different one. This is a newer one. This is Shante Matagawa, and he did very unusual um, subjects, and it was more kind of impressionistic. They weren't always that real, but many people really liked the composition of this kind of a print. And these uh, really, I'm surprised that uh, maybe he did a lot more prints because they don't bring in as much money as, as some of the other ones. Catching fireflies. This one is, um, and this was, a, there's a little bit of damage on here, but um, Kabuki theater in those days was their form of entertainment. This might've been an art, um, an actor there, and it, this could have been a, um, a poster in front of a theater. So <clears throat> they exaggerated many parts of <laughs> the poster, and this could be the title of maybe the, the theater uh, presentation. And, but now it doesn't, you can see a little bit of identification down here, but I don't see a censor print. Uh, maybe censors didn't always censor the theater because, you know, they don't know what, what the storyline was. Anyway, but uh, Kabuki Theater, uh, that's a whole new story, which is very interesting. Uh, they did not, um, you can tell this is a samurai because he had the swords on here. And uh, you can see the artist. Um, and this could be a censor print, um, a censor seal. Now this person, um, I couldn't, um, I couldn't uh, really identify, it, but this particular artist, Siraku, uh, did a lot of um, portraits like this, and uh, it was um, the expression on the artist's face was very interesting. They they do these cross eyes, so when they have a dramatic moment in a kabuki play, they will go cross eyes to tell or show the audience, which I don't know, you're so far away, you wouldn't be able to see it, but the expression on their face and these cross eyes um, would tell you, oh, this is a very dramatic moment in the play. So this artist was able to capture that type of expression. And so he was very um, popular at the time. So this is just an example. Now, this <clears throat> is an interesting thing. In the Kabuki theater, they I only used men in the beginning, just like in Shakespeare times. And, but she, so men played women's roles, but you can see that this uh, man has a, he had a shaved head and they wear this little pouch. I'm not sure why on the top of their head, just to kind of cover it, but you can tell, you can uh, know that this is a man playing a woman in a play. <clears throat> but later on, they did use women in, uh, in the Kabuki theater. This is another one. You can see how dramatic uh, this particular artist was with uh, Shirak, Shiraku on his, uh, it's really just beautiful prints. This wasn't one that came into the theater. This is one that came into our discovery shop. And this is that same to Toshi Katu Muzio, just like the um, butterfly, um, the lady catching uh, fireflies. 
he liked to use reds and orange. And this was after the US um, opened up a little bit of Japan, because you can see that there are a Western influence of these men with um, Western dress in. This is supposed to be a waitress, I guess you can see a tray here and uh, uh, just doing her job. Um, this is uh, another print that came into the discovery shop um, in 1891. <laughs> um, this is hard to do when you have gradations of color in the background. I'm not sure how the printer did this, but um, it's amazing that it didn't run together or, you know, occasionally, I think they may have painted some of the prints after they printed the image, but I'm not sure. <clears throat> now, this was the oldest print that came into the discovery shop, and you can see how faded and the the paper was a little bit wavy and warped inside, but 1790. So, but you, there's still a lot of detail in it. And this shows some ladies uh, that are exiting a boat, but the water may have been too high here. So this man had to carry this lady off of the boat. So they were on a journey. You can see they, um, <clears throat> not a lot of detail in some of the, um, their, um, dress as compared to some of the other pictures, but um, this is very rare because it was such an old print, 1790. This is a sumo wrestler. This one came into uh, the shop and um, you know, they exaggerated, but then you know maybe that person actually looked a lot like that. Now, um, woodblock prints were influencing impressionist artists. So the exaggeration was different and um, oh, oh, it's just this is a this is a one by Taya Kuni, which was one of the associates of Kunisada. This is an early one. Uh, you can get an idea of activities from woodblock prints of, of what people were doing at the time. And she is um, she's got a, it's an interesting container. It's a mosquito incense thing, so you can see the the um, smoke coming out. And she's got a fan, so it's trying to fan it away from her. And I think this explains what it might be. This is another one, which could be a story. Um, I'm not sure. But um, yeah, if you, if you bought one of these prints and you knew somebody who could read the Japanese kanji, that would be great. <laughs> Find out what it was. These, this is an earlier print that came into shop too. This one was one too. Um, now I'm not sure whether this was a kuna, I mean a, um, <clears throat> a poster, but you can see that there there might be this little bag on here, so it might have been a man playing a one. And um, <clears throat> yeah, this is a later print because you can see that the dress is a lot more elaborate in these things. This is the type of letter that was on the back of the prints. So um, they did try to ident identify it and, and, uh, and it is signed by this person and, and was bought in 1981. So this is, uh, and this tells the, um, the artist's name and, and when he was um, living. <clears throat> so it's not, it cannot always be precise. <laughs> And here's an example, the same print again of, of where things were on, on a poster <clears throat> or a print. So Lady with a Drum by Kunis, Kun, Taya Kuni. Um, and this is a print that came into the shop. And this is an instrument that you could, uh, that you see in many prints, I'm not sure. This could be a geisha that uh, because they were trained to entertain and so she, she may be playing it. And this could be her story, who knows. <laughs> now, Hiroshige is a very famous artist and he um, did uh, women and landscape. This is of the mint. This is a print that came into the discovery shop. Um, <clears throat> it's interesting the different things that they would put the artist would put into like umbrellas and people and dogs and 
um, and then why they made this all black unless that building was that way, I don't know, but uh, that's kind of an interesting thing <laughs> if you like buildings. Uh, this is also by him, and you can see that uh, uh, snow is a popular uh, subject. So you can see how uh, they put, incorporated that in. This is Akabana Bridge and a, with a snow scene. This is kind of a uh, uh, famous print that came into the shop too that we were able to get, so that was nice. This was uh, unusual. This was the only print that came into the shop that was translated. This is a poem that's written right here. And um, so somebody was able to translate it. And this is the translation here. This is by Hiroshigi. You can see that um, it's an unusual shape. <clears throat> and it was uh, named with this crescent moon here. Moons are very important to Japanese people. But this could have been a, an example of a shuramono. These were um, unusual paper size and very vivid and the highest quality. So if you were an independently wealthy person, you would try to get an artist to do this for you with your poem and send it to your friends. So, and so this one did come into the shop and it did get a pretty high price because it was not framed. You could see the quality of the paper and you could see the front and back of it and it was pretty vivid, so it's beautiful. This is the translation of the, of the poem that was written on here and they identified the different characters in it. <clears throat> so this was done by the, um, the shop that sold this particular thing. <clears throat> So it does say, behind a thousand trees, the dawn moon fades slowly, distantly a few hills west the autumn stream. So landscapes were um, kind of um, in vogue in the 1820s to the 19, or 1860s. And um, at that time, prints were affordable enough for people to um, regular people could buy them. It wasn't just for rich people to be presents and, you know, giving poems to each other. So um, this next uh, group of uh, slides were about the Taikato Road. And this book did come into the shop and we were able to sell it. And Taikato Road was the road between Tokyo and Kyoto. So a lot of people, it's like a scenic highway. They people like to uh, remember um, <clears throat> what they saw along the way. So this is, this is the, oh, not this one. <laughs> this is not the um, postcard. This is another by Hiroshigi. This is one of the, uh, this is a print that came into our shop. And one of the most iconic uh, symbols was um, Mount Fuji. So people like pictures of Mount Fuji, but this might've been along Taikato Road. So this is another example of um, that particular um, thing. This is, uh, well, I'll skip that one. So this is a book and it had 53 pages. And <clears throat> so the artist is this and they're woodcut prints um, and it's just beautiful, but they were postcard size. So it's by uh, five inches by eight inches. And this is what it looked like on the inside. So they were postcard size. These are woodblock prints. And um, now I think that maybe the artist had some of his, um, his students might have done some of them because they're all a little bit different. The style's different. Um, and then this was the, um, oh, what do you call it? The menu <laughs> that of all the, um, <clears throat> the different uh, scenes that were in the, the book. So I didn't want to take a picture of everyone, but this is one of the nicest ones. But they're, so people would buy this book so they could remember what they saw along the way, a miniature edition. So uh, ladies' fashion was so important to Japanese women. And so they liked to buy woodblock prints to see what the latest fashion was and also the latest hairstyles. So you can see there are some of them are fairly simple and um, this is, it looks like a more contemporary uh, kimono style. 
and you don't you don't see the the identification marks except for the maybe the publisher and the uh, maybe at that time the they it wasn't censored so i'm not sure this is a, a woodblock scene from the red light district and um, a lot of the artists would go to the red light district to pick out their subjects of beautiful women to incorporate in their art so but it shows a scene where people are are pretty busy <laughs> there are men and women that go in there and then these are like little stalls or stands that you could um, engage a geisha um, now geishas were either entertaining or there's courtesans that are there's a, a fine line between the two and i don't want to get into <laughs> all that but it's um <clears throat> interesting so if you ever see the film memoirs of the geisha it's it's a very it's an interesting movie i i liked it and it, you can see it on netflix um this is a, a, sh a showing a predominance of this orange color that this artist liked and um, a subject kind of an interesting subject he's carrying her i'm not sure why um and this might have been an earlier print because um it's more black and white and it has just the reddish purplish orange print this is an entertainer with her monkey and i don't know why they decided to do this other glazing in the back but um I'm not sure whether they put this the glazing in the back first and then printed it out. It's kind of an interesting, it looks like some kind of a color um, technique that we can use today or we use today. Um, that even the gentlemen were interested in fashion. They're not as elaborate. These are three men. <clears throat> um, and uh, their men were not as popular <laughs> and they didn't go out and buy all these the fashion posters so uh, there weren't too many that were made um, and then a lot of times you get an idea of the life of people in japan and there's clothing their style sometimes they had bigger posters of, of like decoration in your house uh, this is an interesting kimono because he's got rats printed on the bottom i don't know <laughs> why unless he's not a very nice person <laughs> And sometimes parts of, um, I mean, look at their faces. These two faces were probably done by the same artist, but look at this hand. This is kind of unusual because it's, it's not really, um, it doesn't really <laughs> go very well with them. But the, these people, uh, they are wearing socks. So in, so in you, when you're inside a house, you take off your clogs and then you just wear your socks. So this was a fairly wealthy household, I guess. This shows women watching some goldfish in a little pond inside. You can notice that these two women were wearing the same um, <clears throat> same style kimono, and then this lady is different. And then notice her her hairstyle is different from these two ladies. Um, this is another one. They started getting very elaborate. Um, they're sharing sweets. This is a dye trip. So um, there's just two in this poster. Um, and they didn't really try to, uh, you know, keep the <laughs> a cohesiveness between the two. But um, you can see how elaborate all the, the costumes were. These might have been, and these two ladies, uh, sometimes you see, well, I'll show you a different picture. Oh, this is an activity where all the ladies were dancing. They all have the same kind of uniform on and they're care and they're dancing with these little horse horse things um this picture uh, this could be a courtesan um or a geisha and these are two ladies who might be in training and then these could be two other younger ladies who are in training so it's kind of a continuation of you know what they the um <clears throat> job that they were going to be getting into but uh, they kind of served as servants also for, for her. But she must have been a fairly wealthy one to have so many people around her. <clears throat> this is just um, kind of an at-home. She's stringing one of those Japanese um, instruments. Not anything really fancy, you know. Um, um, and this is kind of, you can see how vivid these colors are. And then, 
There's Mount Fuji in the background, a popular subject, and this is cherry blossoms. Uh, ladies out on an outing. <clears throat> kind of pretty. Um, and then also look at the um, different hairstyles and like these um, hats that they had. So this is just um, two, two separate. No, it wasn't a separate one because you can see the boat down here. So they tried to keep it together. Uh, but this was in a book, so that's why it has that seam in it. But um, yeah, presentation and fashion was very important to Japanese people. This is a family caught in the rain. And uh, rain and snow uh, <clears throat> were popular subjects for, for these woodblock prints. And also they loved action in, in their woodblock prints. So this is a very windy day and it's stylized. It's not, I mean, you can't see her feet in. Uh, so there was uh, recently a, um, <clears throat> a exhibit by Hokusai um, and I'll show you one of his pictures um, that uh, was presented at the uh, Crocker Art Museum about a month ago. Uh, this, is, this is kind of interesting because she's carrying a bottle in the snow with her lantern and she's outside trying to get home and it's windy. So you can tell all those action parts of it. Either snow or rain. I don't know what these little little marks are. Now she could be a servant because servants usually didn't wear socks on their feet. She, they had bare feet with these little clogs. Now this is, the, I mean, everybody has seen this poster before. This is Hokusai and he's, <clears throat> an interesting artist because he's a little more contemporary, but he has influenced a lot of impressionistic um, artists across the sea. Um, and that's why the Crocker did present uh, a film on the daughter's point of view uh, of, of him. Um, <clears throat> he's, you know, he did influence a lot of these other impressionist artists, but there was a, a film that, uh, was shown about a couple of weeks ago about um, his daughter. Oh, and I didn't spell this right, sorry. Um, she lived with him and he didn't live with his wife. <laughs> he had a, a, blind, a blind daughter who lived with the wife, but he and this daughter, uh, this daughter and a junk cousin used to live together. He was a very, uh, messy housekeeper and a lot of times they would go get drunk and he wouldn't uh, finish a work. So it showed in this film that it's possible that the daughter finished some of the work because that's how he earned his money. If he didn't finish his work or he threw it away or he destroyed it because he just was frustrated or he didn't think it was good enough, then she might um, try to reproduce it and paint it for him so that he could get paid because that's how he earned a living. So it's possible the film showed, this was in cartoons, this is a magna film. It's like, um, what do you call those? Uh, oh, but anyway, um, it, it showed that maybe she could have done many of his famous works also, or finished many of his famous work and just took his name. So this is another famous, um, and you can see the, uh, the influence of, it, of the impressionistic because it's, this is a waterfall, but it's not, it doesn't really look like water, <laughs> but you get the idea that something's running down the hill. And then you can see water at the bottom that people are looking up at it. And then these people kind of climbing a, a mountain. So you have an idea of where it is, but it doesn't exactly look like water. Anyway, but he is a very prolific um, artist and he was, um, yeah, quite famous. So, I mean, a lot of his artwork was um, produced in, in, uh, in the United States. Now the subjects um, were beautiful women. And like I said, uh, actresses, or if you were a fairly wealthy woman and you wanted a woodblock print of yourself and you wanted to give a picture to your friends, then uh, you would engage an artist to do that. But you can tell by some of these woodblock prints that um, courtesans tied their obis in the front and they were in indoors, they were barefoot. Um, outdoors, they had those very high clogs. 
And um, <clears throat> a lot of the tea house geisha were shown with instruments. So you could tell that they were entertainers. And the respectable women had fancier <clears throat> frocks. Now she could be a geisha because she's not wearing socks um, and she's reading a letter. And you can see how stylized her, her robe is because I'm not sure that um, in those days they could manage all this material. But uh, um, also um, this is a geisha with a fan. You can see how elaborate her hairstyle was. <clears throat> And this is uh, so they could have an individual print or they could have, you know, group prints. This is a good example of hairstyles. And you can see the back and the front of a hairstyle, how they tied up their hair and put combs and all kinds of things. So most of the respectable women didn't have a lot of these elaborate combs. And some of these combs were like um, gifts from their sponsors. Um, and this one is like the, one of the first ones that you saw, just, um, uh, just beautiful kimonos. Oh, now married ladies, <clears throat> unmarried ladies could have long sleeves. I mean, um, yeah, unmarried ladies would have long sleeves. Married ladies would have short sleeves. I don't know exactly what she's carrying or something. Um, so uh, many of the woodblock prints showed people doing activities at home, having tea. She took off her socks and she's lighting a lamp here. So this is a lady with, um, and a windy day. So they liked wind, they liked action in their prints. I mean, it was more, um, it was more popular for an artist to put some action in his prints. So you can <clears throat> see prints and, in different places. In Hawaii, there's a James Michener Art uh, Gallery. And I mean, the Art Gallery Institute in Hawaii has a collection of James Michener. He collected prints. Eleanor McClatchy has a collection at Samsi, which I would love to make an uh, arrangement to see. And the Rowan Art Gallery in New York is just, I mean, he's probably one of the biggest ones that carries uh, uh, Japanese woodblock prints, and he is quite an authority. I mean, I spoke to him on the phone, and he he knows so much about it. Um, and then collections in art museums, and I, you know, when you visit a place, this is something that I've been to some of these places, but I never really took an interest into it. So if I ever get a chance to go back, I certainly would definitely want to look at their woodblock prints collection. So you can see in Tokyo, in London, and um, Chicago. Carol. And we have a collection in the Crocker Art Machine, but I don't know when they're going to show it or how large it is. But when I talked to them, they said they couldn't afford to buy our collection. And, um, you know, they had enough, I guess. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> let's see. Oh, and this is a reading. If you want to read more about, I did use uh, this book uh, by uh, Margaret Kanata, um, because I, I didn't, as a reference book for a lot of the um, <clears throat> stuff that I talked about. But some, Jack Heller is quite an authority about it. And uh, you can see there's two books that he, and they're older books though. If you can find them, uh, if you need to read about them. And this one is very interesting too, and, but you have to know Japanese. And this person is very famous for talking about it. I did not read this one, but um, it's a very interesting uh, subject. It's just um, in the old days before people had to make things so intricate and produce these things, it's just, I, it just keeps amazing me. So that's the end of my talk. Um, this is um, one of the more famous things, um, you can see that she's getting off a boat. So they like boats, they like water. And this is the title of, of this boat. I think this is like, it's snow. And so it's starting to snow, she's getting off the boat and uh, <clears throat> she's got quite an elaborate. Um, and you can, you have to remember each color was applied at different times. So it's just, just uh, a work of art. So thank you very much. <clears throat>
So Melissa, that's the end of my presentation. Uh, that was amazing. Thank you. Uh, we have some questions in the chat room, so maybe we can look at those. Uh, is one black re-inked with different colors or do they have separate blacks for each color? It's a combination. Of ah, the, okay. Depends on how saturated the first major block is. And if they have to, if it looks like it's going to be too messy, then they'll print it with a separate color. Okay. Uh, I believe some of the backgrounds with gradations of color are similar to watercolor washes mm -hmm. with the black print then printed on the colored wash. Yes, that's possible. That kind of makes sense, yeah. Mm -hmm. So many of the faces look sort of mean. Not a lot of smiles. <laughs> no, well, Japanese people are very um, <laughs> calm people. <laughs> They had a lot of wars in Japan too. People had to get up and move. So they weren't always happy about that, I think. Uh, yeah, I, I get that. So uh, what or where is the SAMSI? It's um, off of Richards Boulevard. You have to make an appointment. Uh, you know, they have climate controlled collections in there. It's uh, not artwork. They have all kinds of things. Yeah. Uh, someone says, uh, Thank you, Karen, very informative and enjoyable. If anyone else wants to unmute themselves and ask a quick question, we're, we've run out of time. That was perfect timing, Karen. And- I carried on so long. <laughs> no, 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 it was important and really interesting. Oh, thank you, it was fun. <laughs> you just taught all yourself that in the last few months. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Anybody? <clears throat> 